So, yeah, no real things. Thank you. The family. So show. it's now re it's now recording. So. Uh, do you want to introduce us, Karen, or to kick it off? What the, it was, this was your idea, so. Uh, yeah, I would love to. Um, and then I'll, I'll back out and hide my video so that we can just see you two, um, because you're the ones who are the stars of this show. Um, so I'm Karen Whistling from Athabasca University Press. I'm the marketing and production coordinator. Um, and today we're here to listen to this discussion between Martin Weller, who is the author of 25 Years of EdTech, which is this book right here. And you can download this for free from the AU Press website. Um, I've put a link in the chat and I will put it there again so that you don't miss it. Um, Martin is the director of the Open Education Research Hub and he chaired the Open University's first major online e-learning course in 1999. Um, and that attracted over 15,000 students. Um, and he has been working in EdTech for a long time, and you can find a lot of his writings at edtechy.net. And Anne-Marie Scott is the new Deputy Provost of Athabasca University, and we're so lucky to have her on board. She has over 18 years of experience in online and distance education. And before joining Athabasca University and moving to Frigid Edmonton, she was the Deputy Director of Learning, Teaching, and Web Services at the University of Edinburgh. And she's also the board chair of the Aperio Software Foundation and an advisor to Open ETC in BC. Um, so take it away, Martin and Anne Marie. I hope we'll learn a lot from this discussion, and I'm looking forward to sitting back and listening. Thanks, Karen. And, Thanks, Karen. And thank you, Martin, for being willing to to do this today. I have my free copy of your book as well. Look, I've even read it, the sticky notes and things in it. I, do <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't have to pay for it though, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, my office before we before we got turfed out of um, our buildings and all had to work from home, I was one floor above Karen and so the minute it arrived, I think I got my copy before you got your copy because I got oh, it did. literally yeah. hot off the press in a box. So <laughs> So, so yeah, thank you for being willing to do this today. We talked about doing this um, oh, a few weeks ago, months ago, time is a blur, um, when the book was first launched and then the world just went a bit crazy. Um, and I know you postponed various launch events that you had for the book. Um, but we were chatting again and I think there's, there's a lot to say now about the time that we're in. And I know you've been doing other presentations and contributing to lots of initiatives around this, but... But when me reading the book recently, thinking about where we're at, there were some things that were quite striking for me. And I think it's a, it's an interesting time to, to, why write this book and why is it relevant now? Is it relevant now? So I guess that would be my first question. Why did you write, why did you write this book, Martin? Because you'd written 25 or so blog posts, which were the foundation for this yeah. book. So, so why pull it together into a book? Why is the book um, important? So the, the sort of background to the book was, um, I'm the president of uh, Alt Association for Learning Technology in the UK, and they said they celebrate their 25th uh, anniversary in 2018. And I feel she thought, why don't I write a blog series to go along with this? Like one post, one technology for every year, like leading up to the 25 years. And those things you start doing and think, why did I start doing this when you get to like 2007 or something? But actually, I, I found it a very useful process to go through, like just from my own personal perspective like to reflect back on things and to try and put out some lessons and once you started doing it well actually this is kind of rich history here um so i think i wrote the book for a number of reasons kind of pre-covid but we'll come back to that in a bit um I, I wrote it partly because um there's this whole kind of uh sort of year zero mentality um i see there's there's an i see there's an audrey and that's audrey waters in the in the room so, so Audrey writes a lot about this you know about uh, how this is kind of like uh, historical amnesia in a lot of ed tech and, and that's not an accident it's, it's partly it's because if you want to sell people stuff then um, tell them it's, it's never been done before creates a kind of much more exciting narrative and that's the whole kind of thing of around disruption and that kind of uh, these kind of myths are coming out of uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, so partly there's that kind of story, and it's kind of like you get on board now, you don't understand stuff. So they often dismiss any knowledge that's in higher education, um, and it's kind of assumed that people from outside of higher education need to ride in on their 
white horses or probably do some Harleys or something and, and save higher education from not understanding uh, uh, educational technology. Um, and also that I wanted to kind of demonstrate there was a kind of alternative narrative to that, you know, that this innovation has gone on uh, in, in higher education, um, but often operates to a different kind of time scale and for different reasons than uh, than you get from kind of ed tech startups at the time. Um, and the other reason was that I think, you know, part of the richness of ed tech uh, as a field, discipline, topic, whatever you want to call it, um, I'm not going to go into that argument again, but <laughs> I'm not quite sure what it is. But it's kind of part of the joy of it is that people come into it from different areas. Like, so you know, I always just give this up. If you're at a chemistry conference and you sit down at, for a, a coffee with people you don't know, you know that everyone there has probably taken a chemistry PhD and you have all these things in common with them. If you go to an ed tech conference and there might be people who've got you know, philosophy, PhD, someone from history, someone from computer science and stuff, and, and actually that's a real strength. Kind of, but one of the the downsides of that is that um, people don't have a kind of shared framework, I think, for talking about this stuff. So I wanted to kind of like provide a basis, at least in, in kind of more recent history, for people kind of understanding and sharing some stuff. So that was the kind of idea behind the, the book. Um, perhaps I'll stop there because we can come on to then <laughs> what's happened since kind of post-COVID. And I think in some ways, so when we were talking about doing this, I thought, I'm not sure I want to do a launch. It's like, as I joked, I didn't want to go the full Stephen Downs and say what the pandemic is really about is me. Because, <laughs> but I think actually, the more I've gone on and thought about it, there are there is that kind of sense of um, that I was blogging angrily today about some of the kind of really rubbish takes that are coming out about kind of like online learning. It's like you know, there was a comparison between students who had face-to-face -face lectures and then they did the same thing giving them online lectures and they preferred the face-to-face -face lectures like, well yeah it's like, but that's not the only thing you can do online so I kind of, it, it's been quite sort of sobering to see exactly the same arguments that we were facing in 99 sort of coming up again and it's, have we done nothing since you know, so there is a bit of that yes I think that's what that's what really struck me when we were going backwards and forwards about whether whether this was a thing you wanted to do. I, I felt strongly from having read the book, the argument you put forward about this year zero mentality and and our historical amnesia plus um, the kind of warning signs that Audrey and others have been signaling around, you know, this moment in time and kind of predatory activities at this very moment in time. Um, and and exactly what you're describing, some of the the you know pivot to online learning, which isn't isn't what any of us would recognize as good practice, all for me meant that what you covered in the book was almost more important now. You know, it's not irrelevant now. It's more important now because the challenge we have is is a, a challenge of scale that none of the MOOC platforms have ever dealt with. Um, it, and I, I guess my what I struggle with, and what I think we're all struggling with, is how can we digest some of this history in a hurry? Because I feel it's more important now. Um, and you know, it's 189 pages long. <laughs> That's fair. And, it's, it's, your, and Audrey, it's an ed-tech toilet book. You can read a chapter <laughs> on the toilet every day. That's what I'm aiming at. But, you know, Audrey produced a fantastic resource kind of at the um, turning point of the year around the kind of you know, 100 dreadful things in the last 10 years in ed-tech. And this stuff is so important. But right now, in this moment in time, where we're all suffering from kind of information overload as well as just trying to to handle the reality of our lives how do we learn these lessons quickly and succinctly and across the board because i do agree with you this horse historical amnesia yeah. and this disruption narrative are really dangerous right now that's right and you say there's, there's lots of people saying aha see what you need to solve this kind of problem is my technology that i've got here in my back pocket you know so we're getting yeah. lots of those pieces where people are proposing the technology to solve, solve it and they just happen to be the ceo of a company that delivers that technology um so in, in your answer your question of how do we get around it I mean, obviously everyone should read the book i mean that's the kind of the key takeaway but i think actually um the, the other thing is to, to listen to your own sort of ed tech instructional designers or whatever in your own institution often um and i think that that's often not been the case in you know, lots of 
um, ed tech units, whatever you want to call them, they often get moved around. Sometimes they're in the library, sometimes they're in the kind of IT services, sometimes they're in student support, sometimes they're not even a unit and they're kind of split up all over the place. And they tend to kind of get shunted around and have to make prioritize whatever the, the current trend is. And they're not often trusted, I don't I think, you know, with their own expertise and, and listened to. So I think, you know, there's, there are going to be lots of pockets of expertise within any institution. Um, and those are the people you want to have in the room, I think, when you know the ed tech vendors come calling. And, and, and I have a lot of sympathy for um, senior management in universities and colleges at the moment. You know, they have to deal with an awful lot. You know, they, you know, no, no one's had to deal with this kind of stuff. Or not, no one, lots of people haven't had to deal with this before. Um, and you know, they wanted to go away. And I sort of wrote this post about the magic button. It's like, please, someone just make online learning happen for me. <laughs> and actually, the answers we give are horrible and boring you know it takes a long time you need to invest in staff it's expensive you know all those sorts of things um you need to create teams all that stuff and, and what they want is just like someone just make it happen for me and so you know there's going to be lots of companies coming along going we can make it happen for you we have the magic button it's going to cost you x but we can take that away from you. and you know that would be that's quite an appealing thing i think but there is a there's a danger that a what they give you isn't really what you need to be doing but also um, you're just creating problems for yourself further down the line then because you're not investing in staff who need to kind of develop that expertise. Yeah, there's a really kind of, it's a very instrumentalist way of, of approaching the challenge that we have in front of us. You know, you can slot this technology in and it runs counter to everything we know, even about technology change where, you know, technology is one piece, but culture change, people change, process change. Mm. The, all, all of these things happen in tandem. And yeah, it's like we can just slot the technology and forget about the other stuff. That will fall into line because the technology is, yeah. is magical. Your, your comment about senior management there reminds me of a, a line in the book which has really, <laughs> really stuck with me in the last, just rereading and, and thinking about this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to read your book back to you. Okay, it, <laughs> Unless a university principal is being required to save a university from imminent collapse, the kind of high pressure, rapid institutional transformation often seen in tech companies is disruptive in its original sense and harmful to the functioning of a university. That really struck me. What are university principals doing right now across the world? Yeah, <laughs> so obviously I wrote that line <laughs> pretty, pretty good. <laughs> and perhaps they, they don't hold up. Because they are now facing that imminent disaster. But the point I was yeah. trying to make there was, um, you know, the kind of comparison is I think you know, universities operate on longer wavelengths. It's like, you know, so they have changed, but it's like, you know, over longer periods, whereas, you know, a lot of ed tech startups are you know, rapid innovation, and the whole model is to kind of float on the stock market and get a profit, and then you know often they they stop functioning or they get bought out by Google and kind of stuff. So they're kind of doing this, and so it's about that. And a lot of that language from that innovation and Silicon Valley kind of way of working has seeped into higher education. And you'll see lots of adverts for senior management who need to be kind of like promoting the idea of rapid change and doing this kind of stuff. And we suffered from that uh, at the Open University a couple of years back. So we're sort of really bought into that. And actually, the universities have been around for 50, 100, 200 years. And it's like, so you don't want to be operating on that same kind of model that has that kind of rapid change. But now, having said that, like a smart ass, I'm now facing the thing. Well, actually, they do need to make some rapid change and, so, and uh, put those things. But, in, but, it, but the, the same thing still applies. You know, it's like they're, they're trying to make decisions of they need to get through the next few years. But it's like, they are, you know, they're making changes about and decisions about an institution that should persist into the future in the long run and not sort of disappear after five, ten years with a big kind of buyout. And you need different strategies for those two different approaches, I think. And I guess what I found reassuring in in that, and again, you, you touch on it in the book, is the LMS. And, you know, certain friends of ours will describe it as the technology that just won't die. Mm -hmm. But you describe it in the book as, uh, you know, it's it's it was designed for education it's it's one of the few technologies that is well embedded and mm. in this in this pivot the great pivot as it will historically become known i'm sure um it it's you know even the most out there ed techs are falling back on the institutional lms because it's you know it's designed for scale people kind of get what it is with minimal 
amounts of training and hand holding. There's a it's a maybe a kind of boring pedagogical model, but there's a model mm. that people can kind of see from the minute they they log in and, and start playing with it. And I wonder, in some senses, that kind of conservative turn is is disappointing. It's expedient. And I'm not going to argue against it, but I wonder if it also is helpful in the long run because it, I think it reinforces the the point that you've made about technologies that are designed for purpose, and where the kind of human effort to pay off is the right balance. You know, yeah. we can see how we can use this immediately, quickly, and get to somewhere we need to get to quite fast. Um, and, yeah. and so I wonder whether actually that will run against some of this sort of shiny snake oil salesman. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think so the LMS is an interesting example throughout. So I boldly declared in 2007 the LMS or the VLE is dead. <laughs> and uh, I've got some colleagues in Ireland to keep reminding me of that. Um, but I think uh, you're absolutely right. So, you know, uh, that would be one of the the kind of examples I think of where understanding the history would be useful because you know we've we've had LMSs and lots of people suddenly go oh my god what do we do it's like you've got this thing right here you can do most of what you need to do I mean you might need to stick some more servers in or something you know and, and put some more support stuff suddenly putting everyone online but you've probably got this technology that can do most of what you need to do but the problem isn't a technology one then you know you, you can actually do quite innovative things with a with a VLE it's like you know if you've got enough imagination, you know, you can, it's not limiting you particularly in what you can do. You know, it, it's not so much fun. And, and you take away some of that stuff that, you know, people like uh, Jim Groom and Brian Lamb like to talk about, you know, about the sort of get people to experience the kind of open web as a kind of environment. And, and I get that. But even then, you can do that from a VLE or an LMS. You can sort of have people linking out. So, um, you know, I think it's interesting because it's there and you can do a lot of this stuff already. But what, you, what it demonstrates is that in order for it to be good, you need to really invest and get people to understand online pedagogy, you know, how to get students to work effectively, that kind of stuff. Um, and I think the other thing you'd want to put in place is understanding the stepping stones beyond that, if you like. And the problem with the, with the VLE LMS is like, um, sort of around the, the 2000s, the start of 2000s, there were lots of kind of like cottage industries in, in universities. So like, you know, the med school would have one package and, engineering would have one that someone's knocked up on their Linux server and someone else would have something else. And, you know, having a kind of enterprise system um, gave students a, a uniform experience, but also allowed the whole university to centralise things like student support. And so, and so allowed them to kind of become e-learning much quicker and kind of add boosters to that. But then it, it, this kind of sediment builds up around it. And that sediment is admin process, you know, resourcing of your IT support staff roadmap so actually the solution to all your e-learning issues is always what can we do in the VLE instead of thinking beyond that so I think if, if now if people are that's my dog complain no uh, he's finished his bone um so yeah the solution of course is always like the VLE and it has to be within the VLE and I think so if now if we're going back to the VLE and, and for lots of universities making it much more central than they had been before. They need to put in place, you know, that's good, but you know, what are our steps beyond that already? And I think that's something you can learn from understanding the history. Yeah, and I think I think <laughs> your point about he was telling at the mention of the VLE. That's what he came on me and my writing retreat to write the book. So he just heard all this before I can think. Oh bless. I have to ask, um, bones or sticks, what's his preference? Uh, but like to chase a stick, chew a bone, and just finish the bone. Okay, <laughs> important important knowledge. Um, yeah, you you that investment in online pedagogy and in in professional development for our academic staff, I think that is, I think that's a missing piece in a lot of institutions. You're you're absolutely right. There's training, um, and quite often there's you know some kind of postgraduate certificate. Um, but there's maybe nothing in that gap in between. Um, and again, this is where working with your local ed techs, learning technologists, learning designers, whatever we're calling them, instructional designers, whatever they're called, um, can can help. Um, but when, I mean, I'm now at an open university, and clearly you're at the Open University of the UK. One of the areas I'm not seeing an awful lot of focus on right now is student supports 
So yeah. we're seeing a lot of discussion about how do we upskill hundreds of staff so that they can deliver a you know, fall semester of, of online learning. But what we know in our institutions is that you have to orient intentionally orient students to online learning as well. Yeah. Um, and I'm not seeing a lot of activity in that space. No, I think you're right. Um, Clint's in the chat. So Clint put together a good collection of resources the other day. So you might want to put that a link to that in the chat, Clint, about the issues of student support. And I think you're right that the um, analogy I give is that um, when you go to a campus university, the, the architecture, the, the physical buildings do a lot of work for you. Um, so you turn up to a lecture at a certain time and receive your content. You know, if you're there at that time, you'll get this. You go to another building in the library to get your resources. You know, you might go to somewhere else to do socialising. And socialising is important in terms of you know, connecting and feeling part and a, a whole kind of academic identity. You might go to somewhere else to do your kind of studying, computer uh, centre and that stuff. So the buildings do a lot of that stuff for you. And when you when you work online, um, you know, with our distant students, um, then they have to take on a lot of that kind of responsibility. So they have to kind of, particularly if you're studying asynchronously, which is a real benefit of studying online, but they have to kind of organise their time around other competing pressures often. Um, and they have a lot more kind of agency, which is, which is great in many ways. They can you know, decide when they want to learn, when it's best for them and, and fit it around other things. But also the, the, a lot of kind of that responsibility for organising your time and getting feedback and, and making connections with other students um, falls on the individual student, and that's really difficult. So we have lots of onboarding, for want of a better phrase, for our open university students. You know, we, have, we have a course on being an open university student, a kind of free open course for you start. So I think that's what that's going to be a big issue for lots of students, you know, particularly if they didn't want to study this way. Uh, in the blog post I put out today, a link to an article uh, uh, some colleagues of mine did a few years ago at the OU. And, you know, it's not rocket science, but you know, students who choose to study distance education really like distance education. Students who choose to study on campus like being on campus. You know, like so, so your your perception of quality is framed by your preferences. But what we're going to have that you know, if you want to talk about this, the, the, people keep talking about the global experiments happening, you know, the experiment is really what you have when people who wanted to learn face to face are forced to learn online. And so they're going to, you know, there might be a kind of mismatch between what they want and what they expect. There. Yeah, and I've seen quite a lot of, of news coverage about, you know, students demanding refunds on their fees because universities are closed. And I think we're doing uh, doing our students a massive disservice, not just in terms of preparing them to succeed in really trying circumstances, but also helping them understand that what they are about to do still has value. It's not a, uh, you know, this was your, the whole point of your blog post this morning, online learning is not a poor substitute. It's not the poor relation. It's different. Yeah. Um, but it's not the poor relation of face-to-face -face teaching. It's a different mode, and it's designed differently. Um, but I think but that, not... that means they, they have to um, really design it differently, as you say. So it is a poor substitute if what you're saying is uh, you're going to come to face-to-face -face lectures, and now we're giving you some online lectures, and that's it, and off we go. Because then you're not taking advantage of any of the, again, uh, for want of a better word, affordances of distance education <laughs> and online learning. But actually, if you make that kind of stuff really work for people, you know, here's a here's a course that's been designed by a team, and you know, you can study it asynchronously, and here's all these other tools we're going to use. And actually, uh, there's there's a kind of real advantage you can sell that as an advantage. But I think if if all you're doing is the kind of deficit model of you know, we know it's not as good as face to face lectures, but here's a, here's a Zoom lecture, then you're always going to get that, that attitude. But I think you're right. It's going to and um, I don't know if you saw uh, Durham University. There were plans leaked that they were going to shift online and there was a kind of big backlash, partly because they didn't consult for one of the thing, uh, but also mm -hmm. the fear of job losses. But, but but a lot of the reaction to people, they backtracked and said, we're not going to do that. And actually a lot of that, uh, it's almost like jubilation around, uh, they've, they've given up those online plans as if teaching online is itself a bad thing. It's like, and that wasn't a bad part of their plan, you know, to shift some of the stuff online. So. Yeah, and your, your point you just made there about job losses, that's one of the other myths in this space, isn't it? That you know, online online teaching is somehow um, cheaper, less resource intensive. You need fewer teachers to do it. I think, yeah, uh, I, mean, I think that's, <laughs> so, um, 
that there was a phrase at the end of the 90s i'm not sure if i made it up you know, <laughs> this idea of the, the lecture hall you know it's like so and we saw it i think coming back again with mooch you know you just need to shoot a talking head and then a hundred thousand people can study it you don't need all these these things but um the actually in order for any of this stuff to work and as we know it's like you need you need human support it's like <laughs> that's not rocket science like but you know, um we have we have graphs of how much it costs to make an open university course it's like it's like broken down into chunks and there's like you know the production costs and the presentation course and the biggest chunk is this big bit in the middle which is like the tutor support for students is like the, the human parts so, yeah sure if you take that out you can do the other bit you know relatively cheaply but it's like that's the bit that really matters you know so. And, and that's the bit that, if we come back to the snake oil salesman again, that's the one of the other things they are promising. Not just, um, the, you know, with this technology we can make your problems go away, but we can also make your courses cheap in mm -hmm. some way, undefined way. Um, because what they're actually trying to say is we can replace some teachers, and and we know that's not true. We know if, if that could be done, that would have been done. Um, and I, I particularly like the work that um, Shan Bain has done at Edinburgh with the Near Future Teaching Project, thinking about the role of a teacher centrally within within this technology space and recentering the teacher and not pushing, being critical about automation and AI and various technologies, but but also saying these things can live harmoniously together. Um, but it does require us to conceive of the role of the teacher differently. Um, and not not as a deficit or or something we want to kind of make more efficient. But um, and I I worry about that at this moment in time, particularly with the black holes in finances that that people are facing. That that there's an extra level of seduction that might be in some of these you know technology presentations. Not just will it solve your problems, mm. but it will well it'll solve a number of problems, including your money problem. And I, yeah, I agree. I think you know I like Sean's work as well. It's excellent. And I think um, that was one of the things that sort of emerged out of the book for me, right? That I hadn't really sort of thought of before was um, maybe it was just the technologies I chose, but there seemed to be a kind of shift uh, over the twenty-five years from this kind of like optimistic world of uh, ed tech, you know, and, and also very kind of experimental. Uh, but also very human-centered as well. You know, so a lot of the early stuff was about, you know, how can we use the web to teach, but also what does it mean to have non-linear text, you know, that, and people were really excited about that, and there's lots of thoughts around the different pedagogies, you know, based around constructivist approaches. Um, and then kind of later on, the sort of technologies we're getting are, you know, blockchain, AI, um, learning analytics, all sorts of things. And again, that, none of those are inherently bad, but actually a lot of the pitch around them is around exactly as you say the kind of removal of the teacher and i think there's kind of simplistically kind of two flavors of ed tech there's the kind of supporting human educators and then there's the kind of trying to remove them and, and simplify the process or make it more cost effective and obviously i, I favor the former <laughs> well I, I think this is where some of shan's work is interesting where she she uses the kind of post-human approaches really to talk about these kind of complex assemblages of humans and technology working together and I find that a useful frame because it's a, it's a more interesting and productive space if you put that frame around things and then and then start to consider technology and humans working in concert together all sorts of possibilities come out of that um, which you you know when we're in this kind of opposition space technology or human um, yeah. Yeah, I think we, we we don't see the full potential there. Your your reference to the kind of critical turn and dystopian um, your final chapter, dystopian visions, has just reminds me of the the cartoon at the end, which I'm going to hold up to the. I want I want Brian Maders to do us a new. Oh, I can't get this right. I want Brian Maders to do us a new version of this cartoon. I don't know if people can see it. And yeah, that bit that says years later, I just need that to be changed to COVID nineteen. Yeah, <laughs> days later. Days <laughs> later. Someone joked that I should do, I should do a follow-up to this book, which is 25 days of EdTech, which is kind of like the change. Oh, uh, 25 minutes of EdTech. <laughs> 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 I 
Um, but maybe that's the historical primer that we need. Maybe that's the short form primer that we need to, you know, to not repeat the, the same mistakes and to, to beware the snake oil salesman. That, that little cartoon really struck with me, not just because the, that time scale in the middle has you know, shrunk years later, like two months later. Um, but that final picture with the you know surveillance and and the sort of lockdown dystopia. Um, and I've been thinking quite a lot about trust because there's you know there's a lot of stuff about online proctoring um, in you know in discussions as people are flipping through online exams. But there's also quite a lot of discussion about what it means to be a remote workforce. Um, you know, so there's something in this moment about the extent to which we trust each other, which is also being, I think, a light is being shone on it. Yeah, um, those like, but again, it's part of that kind of lack of imagination thing again, isn't it? It's like, um, we need to do assessment, we always do exams. So how are we going to do online exams? Aha, we have the solution for you. Here's the magic button, rather than that sort of thing. Do you know what? Maybe exams aren't a good thing to do. Uh, um, and I think actually that might be one of the outcomes of this. So we probably won't see the death of exams. But I think if you think of the higher education sort of system, I think what COVID has is, is revealed to us is there are kind of certain, if you like, weak points in it or kind of roadblocks. And, and exams are certainly one of them, bringing all the people together in one physical location test their time over a set time you know and if you haven't got that you've got no idea of their assessment at all you know so missing that kind of ruins it so i think we'll see a shift to kind of much more um continuous assessment but also maybe more kind of project-based assessment and so but even that comes with this issue because the other thing i've seen is the blockchain boys are in the house i mean they go like do you know what you need to get rid of exams and do um you know, task-based assessment and the only way you can do that is through blockchain <laughs> and this is again i think an example where some understanding of history is useful because uh, uh, maybe blockchain is a really good way to do that you know I, i'm not a blockchain expert but i think you should at least ask the question okay what does blockchain do for us here that you know nearly 20 years of e-portfolios hasn't done so e-portfolios are exactly the same idea that you you know, you break stuff down to lots of little tasks that people collect as they go along, and then at the end they can exhibit it, you know, and it's safe and you know, secure and those kind of things, and you take it with you to different places. Um, and, you know, e-portfolios have had uh, quite a lot of success, particularly in certain disciplines, but perhaps not as much as people thought at the beginning of the 2000s. But, um, but the issues around them are, are not really technical. It's about kind of employers recognising them as a valid thing to do. It's about... Um, educators changing their the way they teach so that you, know, you break it up into kind of smaller chunks it's about students themselves getting to grips with them so actually the problem that blockchain is solving isn't really a problem at all you know it's about um so for blockchain to work in terms of these kind of smaller aggregated pieces of assessment we need to overcome the same issues that equal failures have been trying to overcome for the past 20 years so if you understand that, and that would be the question you could ask your your blockchain salesman who comes knocking at the door. You know. uh, but underneath both of those, you know, remote proctoring and blockchain, I think is still a fundamental position about trust. Mm. If we yeah, do sorry. not uh, verify in some sorry. kind of immutable way um, yeah. that you know you are who you are and you say you've done this work, then we don't trust you, and it's that. We start from a default position of not trusting our students when the research we have around plagiarism tells us it's what maybe six percent of students, and yeah. then you know there are quite specific circumstances, and that I find very interesting right now because a lot of those circumstances, a lot of the research shows us that it's when students feel that they are being asked to do something unfair. You know, when we tip that balance, that kind of contract we have with mm -hmm. them and we're not supporting them, when we're asking them to do something unfair or the stakes for failure are so high that their moral judgment is, you know, they're willing to flex their moral judgment. And right now, in this moment, <laughs> where we demonstrably don't trust them, and that's becoming really, really clear, um, and we're asking them to do high stakes, time bound assessments when we're not really recognizing the life circumstances that they have. I think that's 
all the evidence suggests that that um, we're we're probably causing a problem in this time and space. That these, okay. these technologies are not helping. Um, now, I think there is a big issue around trust. And I think actually, when you do trust students, I mean, I think you know, um, there are, there's a kind of scale of this. And someone like Jesse, uh, someone would be, you know, I've spoken to Jesse about this. And he's like, you know, he doesn't care if students plagiarize, you know, that's fine. They're still learning. That's, that's up to them, kind of thing. And I think there's other people who are kind of at the other end, you know, like no plagiarism has to go. And I think there's probably stances in between. Um, but actually, most students you know, are there because they want to be learning. And if you give them interesting projects as well, it's actually a really good thing to engage in and students and really enjoy that. They don't want to kind of plagiarise someone else's um, project, particularly if it takes a bit of time. Um, so I think it does reveal a lot about us, doesn't it, really? I think this kind of position of um, we want to check you're not cheating all the time. So I, I was at an external examiner on a computer science uh, course once, master's course. And they had to do kind of weekly tasks about coding. And they would be punished if they copied someone else's code. It's like, that's the whole point of being a code, is that you, you find good bits of code and reuse them. So, like, so a far better assessment would be, go and find a bit of code that works and tell me why you think that's a good bit of code. You know, it's like, so it's that kind of plagiarism mindset was even there where you know, copying is actually exactly what you want them to be doing, what you want to teach them. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've had conversations with colleagues here about the extent to which you need to be able to regurgitate things from memory. There are very few jobs in this world where you need that split second knowledge, like heart surgery. Yes. Critical yeah. care nursing. Yes, absolutely. Tax accountancy. Not so much. Um, yes, you do need to know, you know, which taxation rules and, and, and so on. But you couldn't, you've got the time to go and look that up in a book. You need to know what book and you need to pick the right thing from the book. But are we really, are we really, yeah, testing the right stuff? I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. I could, <laughs> I could go down there for ages. But, but I think this moment in time for me certainly is, is shining, is shining a light on a lot of, a lot of these tensions and pressures which have been there just below the surface and they're now becoming really, really visible. And they're becoming really visible to our students. We see a lot of students pushing back against proctoring, against surveillance. Um, I think there's a, I want to say, university in Canada who recently demanded that older students buy webcams so that they can watch them do their maths exams and the students are up in arms about this because mm. They don't have the money, let alone the, the lack of trust. I'm going to ask one more question, um, and then I think we should throw it open um, to the rowdy crowd, because they've been very chatty already, so they should get an opportunity to ask a, a few questions. The final one I wanted to ask, and it's something, again, that struck me as I was reading the book again and reading particularly the chapter on MOOCs and this whole you know, kind of promise of technology at scale. And also thinking about that point you made, which is actually we have a rich history of innovation. You know, the, the book gives us evidence that we, for 25 years, we we are capable of doing for ourselves, serving ourselves, and, um, and meeting our own challenges. I think right now, what we're doing collectively as a sector is an exercise in scaling up, which none of these MOOC platforms have ever done before. This is on a level way, way beyond what any of them have ever done. What are we learning from that? Are we learning anything from it? Well, I, it's an interesting thing with MOOCs. I think actually lots are kind of rushing into that space and, and sometimes, and it's actually been quite useful for lots of people. So Future Learn have been running, you know, how to get your teaching online uh, courses, which you've had lots of people, you know, just in time and been able to do that and it's free and you, know, you can't deny that. So that's a useful thing for them to do. Um, and I think um, if George Siemens were here, um, George would argue that actually the universities who engage with MOOCs are probably in a better position. I'm putting words in George's mouth. I think you'll see him tweet this. Are in a better position to understand how to do some of this stuff, and that might well be true. You know, it's like that you at least you've had to engage with um, understand this stuff. Um, but I think what they what MOOCs have never done is. Um, scale up support and that's going to be to go back to what we were saying about the start and that's going to be the kind of big issue for lots of students um knowing how to support students at a distance um 
and having people in place who have those skills to do that kind of distance and remote support. So that's the kind of going to be the real barrier for lots of them. And, you know, the, the whole kind of just shuffling content of people only gets you so far. And we know that the people who tend to succeed are the people who tend to succeed. You know, it's like, and that's, and they would do it in any environment. It's, it's the other, it's the other learners that you need to worry about. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's interesting, the flip to online lectures, Zoom lectures, some of the research we were doing at Edinburgh around lecture recording was, was showing exactly that. The, the students who were making best use of lecture recording were the ones who had good study skills already. And the students who were just binge watching actually didn't have great study strategies as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem was not the technology. The problem was not lecture recording. The problem was what we're doing to intentionally build study skills and study strategies for our students and help them develop the habits that will help them become successful. Yeah. I think we should throw it open to the chat. Okay. Uh, I can see. Just say people don't have microphones, so you can, you can put it in. So they need to type it into the chat window. I, I can give yes. it. My dog's having a dream now. You might Tyler. <laughs> He's traumatized by the LMS. across the platform. Yeah, so I'd give anyone microphone access if they want to speak, but it doesn't do it by default. There's a few people typing. I saw Clint typing and I saw Erica typing, so we'll see who's going to. Let's see if I can show you. So there's Tyler sleeping. Wait, Tyler. Come and see Come see other people talking. Come on, pick up. Yeah, My lockdown buddy. <laughs> I have enjoyed your um, daily walks with sticks Instagram feed. Yeah, right. <laughs> He's loving lockdowns, right? Yes. <laughs> What's the downside here? I'm not seeing it. <laughs> So I'm waiting to see if anybody's going to ask a question. It's mostly love for your dog at the moment. I distracted <laughs> the dog. It's always a good tactic. Was it? Loads of people have just turned up to see your dog. <laughs> oh, um, Erwin is asking a question. He says, who is a good boy? Oh, that's a very, very profound one. <laughs> that's the goodest boy. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Erica. Eric, Erica does have a, Eric, yes, so... If we could hone in on a key thing, one or two aspects from the last 25 years that we should carry forward, what might that be? Uh, that is a good question. Um, so I think, again, this is probably obvious, but you know, uh, it's, things are fairly new. So I think you know, when you're getting stuff, it's like someone's come along with something that looks new or saying, you know, um, even, um, so uh, Audrey wrote a piece, um, a really kind of deep dive into stuff and, and Audrey sort of, writes about kind of how this isn't unprecedented. I mean, I think in some ways it's unprecedented for it to happen everywhere at the same time, but all just quite right that, you know, it's not, we've had this similar types of things have happened before, you know, so uh, certainly recently in uh, South Africa, when there was the whole kind of fees must fall uh, protests and, and lots of people had to shift online, but even going back uh, other times before that, there have been disasters and things. So even this type of situation isn't that unprecedented, but certainly, Lots of technology and people come on. This is we've got a new way of doing stuff. We've done things similar to that before, um, so that's you know, so to look back and see what's been done before and what we learned about why that worked or didn't work and if those things have changed. Um, School of Health Administration says perseverance. I think that's right. Actually, you know, one of the points I make in the book is that it's a it's a kind of long game. So these things aren't they take a long time to kind of change academic culture. And I think that's a good thing in a way. You know, it's like partly. The, the point of universities and, and higher education that it doesn't change overnight. You know, we didn't close all our libraries down and put everything on laser discs back in the early nineties or something. You know, it's like, um, so I think that kind of understanding that's a long game. I, I was I was partially involved on and off with learning design at the Open University. It took us about ten years to get learning design embedded into OU practice. You know, it's like so. You know, be prepared to bang your head lots of times and stuff. And I think maybe you know, the, the current pandemic sort of speeds some of that up, accelerates it. But even so, it's still, you know, you don't get immediate change from this kind of stuff. You had a great quote in the book, which again really stuck with me around, you know, thinking about the LMS and how central it's been in this pivot. Everything changes while simultaneously staying the same, just seemed to encapsulate it. Everything has changed. 
it's all still in Moodle. Um, <laughs> <what's> the... yes, <laughs> right. I, a lot of <laughs> um, I think that's true, that's right. So Tanner um, says, did one of your book have any surprises for you, things that pushed you to reflect differently or change your position? Um, I think that that point I made earlier about the kind of shift from optimism to pessimism in a way was one of those. Uh, and also I think the shift to a much more kind of conservative approach um, with lots of online learning now was kind of quite a surprise for me that I hadn't really registered with me before. And I think that might partly be due to when it was when it was new, it was new. And you suddenly thought, what can we do differently with this kind of stuff? And now we're kind of surrounded by you know, online technology and the web and social media. None of it seems new, so you end up just taking it for granted in a way. Whereas I, I looked back and, for instance, um, someone proposing like how they would use wikis, and I thought, wow, that's really radical to do, do any of this stuff in a, in a course now. That would be really radical. This was like 1998. So I think that... You know, the way we hadn't fulfilled some of that uh, experimental, radical promise, I think, of e-learning was probably one of those those, those points. I'm going to skip back up the, the chat because um, Katie asked, back to trust, how do we show students that, tr how do we show students that trust and breed their internal motivation? I mean, I think, um, I don't want to sort of go into the whole kind of, assessment thing but I think lots of it comes down to assessment you know and giving people either what people call authentic assessment or even just vaguely interesting assessment like if you have to do a multi -ch multiple choice quiz like every half an hour it's like I I'd be inclined to cheat on those like so I just don't care you know I think you're just not invested in them enough but when you're writing you know a long project that's about something that you're interested in um, then you you want to kind of engage with that and so you're, you're, you're trusting students both in terms not to cheat but also trusting them to to come up with good ideas themselves and to kind of be motivated and I think they need help to do that need, people need help to structure what's a good research question what's an appropriate topic you know, is something too big or too small but th those are the types of things that we can help teach them um, so at, uh, at the Open University I'm the chair of the Open program and that's our big multidisciplinary degree so students can choose any modules they want, so they can study chemistry one year and uh, music another year. And there, we kind of really trusting them to to choose their own paths through their through their degree. And we offer advice and stuff. But that's really interesting. We look at what they study, and they really do study a wide range of topics. You know, so I think it's not just like one or two paths that come through. It's the it's the whole range of things. I think that kind of giving students some kind of agency about what they what they do is, is important. Yeah, we talk a lot about learner-centered learning is learner-centered centered this and this and that and and we don't have many flexible pathways for them or or many options for them to bring themselves to the the plate so i think that trust piece is is pretty solid there um we've has asked uh we've come has asked a question um about your learning analytics chapter I think there's an interesting point about here. I think you said downsides to learning analytics are that they can reduce students to data and the ownership of this data becomes a commodity in itself. But he makes the point that whatever perceptions we build of students are always based on data. Yeah, OK, that, that's fair enough. I, I guess my point there was it was partly driven by, um, I remember going to a learning analytics conference and I think the interesting thing about learning analytics and MOOCs was they kind of brought in these kind of hardcore computer scientists into ed tech and to mix with us kind of hippies who had already been hanging around there. And that was interesting, and I think it was part of that fruitful thing again. But the way they talked about students was always kind of just as data points. Like we can move this data point over here, and we can see this data point, it's an outlier. And they soon became that they weren't talking about humans, you know, actual learners and stuff, you know, you were just a data point. Um, and, I, you know, and the, the idea of being a commodity also is that, you know, it's about you can sell that data to other people. And uh, I think just each time you do that, you're sort of slightly removing yourself from viewing those people as humans with a kind of whole kind of context around them. Yeah, I, I, I think the learning analytics um field is a, well, it's a fascinating one. As you know, it's one I'm particularly interested in, but 
it's another one of those areas like learning technology that brings people from a really wide variety of disciplines and and there isn't a common framework again so you may be coming at it from a, a computing science perspective or you may be coming at it from a learning technology or, or pedagogy perspective and even more so maybe than learning technology it's a field that's still finding its its feet and working out how to bring all those different perspectives together and and i think your, your point earlier about diversity as strength has got to be the watchword inside that that particular community yeah. um, yeah, I'm, I'm, and, not, and it, I'm not anti learning analytics. I want to stress that. And I think, you know, <laughs> we use it quite a lot at the university. And it's, it's very useful for distance uh, education. That, that they, the sort of analogy I give is um, and perhaps to the point that someone's making, you know, um, if you're in a classroom, if you're lecturing, um, then if students look really bored, that's kind of, that's data in a way. And you might res respond to how you're giving your lectures, like, I need to change what I'm saying. Or if they're talking to each other, if they look confused, so you might change what you're saying. Whereas, you can't do that distance, but you can do that with sometimes the analytics. So students seem to be coming back to this resource a lot. Why are they doing that? They're spending longer mm -hmm. here. Maybe we need to change what we're doing. So, you know, it's, it, that's all useful stuff, I think. And that's a particular view of analytics, which is a kind of, I was going to say, quality assurance view of analytics, which I, I, I like a lot of what the Open University do in this space with you know, trying to understand how courses operate and how they're experienced by students, mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to make predictive judgments about students yeah. and their trajectory. Um, it's a different, it's a different lens on the same, you know, the same lying sure. ambition around supporting students, and it seems to be a more rigorous and and maybe more immediately fruitful one as well. Um, Pamela has asked a question. <laughs> What do you think of disruptive innovation as a way of thinking about online learning? I think you said one or two things about this in the book. <laughs> I think it's terrible. Um, I think that <laughs> I've got another talk. I gave a, 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 I was at a conference recently. I was keynote at a conference which was about disruption in higher education. And, and my, my whole piece was why it's a crap theory for education. Um, so I think actually it's just a really bad theory for education it hardly ever occurs in the way you want it in the way it's often portrayed and when it does occur you probably don't want it to occur so, you know, um, so i think when it first came out it was quite an interesting theory uh, and it helped explain some of the things around the digital revolution like why did kodak disappear you know why did microsoft become bigger than ibm but actually when you go to exploit more detail it hardly ever happened in the way that um, christensen set out and when it does happen, it's a, it's a kind of an extinction event, you know. So if you wanted to say we want to disrupt higher education or education, it means getting rid of teachers, getting rid of universities, replacing them with something completely new, which would be a monopoly. That's the other whole, that's why people like it, because why ed tech like it uh, in Silicon Valley, because you have a kind of monopoly of this and, and bringing in a whole new system. And I think, is that really what you want? You know, it's like, so I'm talking about disruption with a big D here rather than sort of a sort of general term. Um, and actually, it's just that it's a thing. It doesn't fit the way education operates, and it's actually a very harmful theory to think about. And I think it kind of contaminates a lot of our language. We also like, we want to disrupt it. It's actually it's anti-cooperative for start. In order for you to disrupt something, you don't want to share anything. You kind of got to own it and, and be the person who drives out the incumbents. And it also says the people who are currently in incumbent and running system. Uh, can't be trusted and their expertise should be swept away and ignored and I think you know, we've got enough of people ignoring expertise at the moment without sort of wanting to make it a goal. So. And it's it, it has yeah. been striking in in this moment of how much sharing has gone on. I mean I, I see it at the kind of ed tech level but I'm also seeing it at, at you know I sit in meetings with all the provosts of the um, the various um, post-secondary institutions and colleges in the province here in Canada, the the amount of sharing that the sector is doing to to just try and get ourselves through this, um, sharing our plans, sharing our you know our our collateral, sharing our expertise, the number of resources that have been put together, you know people crowdsourcing stuff for their own purposes, but sharing it out beyond their own ed tech units just to help anybody. Um, get through this it, that's heartening um, and I think it's it 
it's a reversal of a trend we've been seeing. That disruptive narrative has has gone hand in hand with marketization and competition. And that's not the sector or the university I started working in, but that you know, that's the sector I find myself working in now. The um the, the thing the sharing thing is interesting. It's also another kind of example of why understanding a bit of history is useful because it might be that now learning objects are going to finally take off because so this idea of reusable content that everyone does maybe their time has come you know it's like, so because actually if everyone needs to go online simultaneously you know perhaps we don't need to all create the same content you know and we could share it you know so finally we've still not got the time to fill out the metadata but Martin there's, <laughs> those twenty seven there's still no time to <laughs> Are waiting for us, but, yeah. but but now like, <laughs> I think the part, the problem, is like, not what we need. <laughs> part of the problem with learning objects was the return on investment wasn't great enough because not enough people used them when you made them, and you'd if you did have to fill that stuff out by hand. But now there might be enough of that kind of return. So again, it might be one of those ideas that sort of comes around again. And if it does, that it'd be useful to know why they didn't succeed the first time around, so you can at least try and avoid mm -hmm. those. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, we've got three minutes left before we hit the top of the hour. Um, I'm gonna um, abuse my privileges here, um, and there's a there's two questions I want to ask. So one one is literally for a friend, but I think it will speak to a lot of a lot of people on the um, on the call here. Um, which was is there still a place for adventurous ed tech? in a world where few teams have developers and we're all just answering help tickets now. Um, I'm asking you to do some future gazing now. Will, yeah, we, will think, we ever do anything fun again? <laughs> I think in the short term, probably no. I think there's a kind of like survival emergency mode at the moment, you know. Um, and that partly speaks to that uh, really good piece that uh, Brian Lamb wrote, you know, about, you know, now it's not the time to do that kind of stuff. And I think when you're trying to get lots of new learners online who aren't studying that way, the last thing you need to do is just throw a really strange pedagogy at them as well that's kind of you know difficult to follow and difficult for them to know if they're doing the right thing. But I think once we get through that, I, mean, I think I don't think after this shift everyone's going to be online forever, but I think there'll definitely be a kind of a lift up of the number of people teaching online and the kind of investment in that. So once you've done that, I think there will be a kind of second wave or third wave, whatever. Um, people start to think, okay, what can we do that's maybe a bit more interesting this now? Particularly if we do start to do things differently around assessment, you know, how are we going to do that? So I think that there's a, perhaps some of that a return, to some of that kind of experimentation and optimism we saw in the kind of early nine, late nineties might might return once we kind of have got a stable base, if you like, to, to work from. That's what I'd like to. Yeah, imagine. I guess I, I'd hope, like you, in a few years' time or a year and a half's time or whatever. I mean, Tony Bates has made some predictions in this space about, yeah, you know, we're great. not going to see a huge uptick in the, the use of online learning. Some people will, will go that direction. But what we'll probably see is a, a much larger uptick in, in blended learning. Um, when campuses open again, the use of technology will, will probably stay high. And so that, yeah, I think you're right. That's where the potential for, now that we've got maybe a, a new group of people hooked, um, whether they wanted to be or not, they are now. Then, then once we get past this moment in time, yeah, their their interest in experimenting might be there, and and so that potential might be there for us. But I agree with you. I sadly don't think it's going to be any time soon because we're all just getting through. Um, I'm going to ask. <laughs> I'm going to ask my final question. I know you. I noticed your your. Um, recent blog posts that you posted about past, present and future, your future one was very short um, and you, you you know, very much didn't want to play into trying to predict the future and you pulled the same trick in the con conclusion to the book as well. Um, but one funny thought has been running through my head, I just want your opinion on it. What is the Horizon Report 2021 going to say? <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> right. right now, L and S's are hot shit. <laughs> I wonder if you could just actually uh, revise the horizon report from about 2005 and that's probably about what would be a good one <laughs> like, you know, I've started doing uh, carrying on doing the technology per year kind of thing so last year my 
technology or technology trend was micro credentials. It's like, uh, I think, well, what's it going to be this year? <laughs> I think it's going to be the online pivot. So it'll be interesting, yeah, to see what they. But, uh, but even then, it will be very technology focused rather than all the things we talked about, you know, support, you know, pedagogy, you know, staff development, all those kind of things, which are actually going to be the, the things you need to do. Yeah, and I think I have to give a shout out at this point to the Innovating Pedagogy Report, which the OU in the UK produce, which for me has always been the counterbalance to the Horizon Report. And actually, if you read the two things together, then it can be, you know, it can spark some interesting thinking. Um, but that's, a, yeah, technology enhanced, technology mediated, but focused squarely on the, on the pedagogy. And I think I'm right in saying that some of those some of the information from that resource has been sort of chunked up into some quick right, yeah. digest right, right. Right. as well, which is available online. Another fantastic example of all the sharing we're doing in this moment. We are two minutes past the hour. Um, and we have a dog to eat. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a beer to be had and a bone to be chewed in your house. And um, I don't, I don't want to hold other people back from their evenings or work days if you're in my time zone or something like it. So I just want to say thank you again um, for taking the time to do this and to have a chat. And um, and I guess we should plug the book one more time, which should. is available for free. <laughs> and Thanks, also, Andrew. if people haven't seen it, if people haven't seen it, the cover is available to remix online as well. You yes. can make your own version of it. Very so cool. if you want, it's incredibly cool. So go and have a look at Brian Mather's um, visualthinkery.com at the remix machine and remix your own front cover to the book. And I think there's a good good gallery of people's, because that was all happening just as the pivot was sort of starting. Yeah, so true. there's there's a chunk of some very funny graphics there. So go and have a look. Oh, yeah, thank you, Karen. put the link to the remix. It's cool. Brilliant. Perfect. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. very much, Anne Marie. I really enjoyed that. It was a good chat. Thank you, folks. No problem. I really enjoyed it too. It was a really nice, really, really nice way to spend my lunch hour. And mm -hmm. um, I'll stop the broadcast on DS one hundred and six.